Good morning. So as you can see, I have successfully got the box together. Wasn't too stressful, but it was a little bit ropey at times as well. Front's looking great. There's a few gaps on the back, which we spotted before, but now in this episode, we are going to be faceting the edges, but I just wanted to quickly explain to you how I actually cut these blocks to the correct angle in the first place, because it's quite, might be quite interesting to some of you. Because obviously for me to get pressure this way, both of these faces need to be parallel with one another. And very simply, this is how I did it. I put a square on the workbench, squared line up the front, and then put a square on the front like that and squared it back. That was pretty much it. And then just cut that off freehand with a Ryover. Very simply put, using the workbench below as a datum surface and then the front of the box as a datum as well. Firstly, I need to get these blocks off. Yeah, all right, maybe that isn't the quickest way. So I've got the blocks off the side and obviously some of these joints, the uh, the tails have, like they never quite got all the way through the sockets like that. We knew that from the start, that was fine. And I could go through the effort of flushing off these edges, but because the whole thing's gonna be faceted anyway, I'm not gonna bother with that. But before drawing on the facets, I need to get the feet actually sitting flat on the workbench below, because you see they're still tilted with that compound angle. And to ensure everything stays level, I'm gonna do this with a marking gauge. Whoa, that was close. Maybe I shouldn't be pushing that way so hard. So you're probably looking at this now and realizing that actually it doesn't look quite as cool as it used to. I, I liked how the edges looked like they were tiptoeing on these pieces of end material, but now they're sitting flat on the workbench below. It's kind of lost that element of uh, angledness, if that's a word. But don't worry about that too much because what I'm hoping is by shaping these edges, we are going to reintroduce that back into the design, but better. And what I'm thinking is if we've got the front currently looking like this, so square bottom, square top, and then angled from the front, obviously dovetails are going into the end component like that. What we're gonna do is create a little angle here to start with. So all of this will be waste material. And then we're gonna draw a line from that top corner down to somewhere here. 
so effectively it's like it looks like it's tapered well it is tapered dovetails i suppose from the top down to the bottom so you're left with this really cool like angled looking thing so if i'm to do that on here let's maybe come in how far down is that going about five mil six mil let's go across four millimeters from this inside edge and then we'll have the bottom something like maybe 15 mil thick yeah i think that looks pretty good so I'll just quickly draw that on all four corners. Right, now I've got options here. I could carry this angle all the way through that back piece and just have that edge completely flat, just more tilted than it is now. And although that would look cool, I do want to experiment with this a little bit and start putting some facets on it and then see how it looks, but on the actual piece. I can't be bothered to do any of that prototype in Malarkey. So the first thing I need to do, find the centre line on this edge, and then each of these points will join up to that centre point, and then that will create two triangular shaped facets on either corner, thus creating a third one in the middle. Okay, so they're drawn out, and as you can see, we're gonna cut off the majority of these uh, steps that we've got here. There is this corner here which isn't going to quite make it however. I could plane down this entire side and then redraw on the facet but I think if I plane these angles on I'll be able to do any small tweaks after I flush that off so it shouldn't be too much of an issue. Now I could just clamp this upright and then try and plane those facets on but I think that's going to take ages. I've got about 10 mil of material to remove on each of these corners so we're going to take a risk and rough cut it with the Ryoba. Now don't forget I am expecting to uncover gaps in doing this but we're going to fix them afterwards. So starting on the corner closest to me, I'm just going to get the saw tracking along each of these lines so I'll start with the top. We'll track it down the front next. Right, we've got a bit of a fun one to sort out these facets because if I plane this way then I'm going against the grain of this bit because it's going to be like an uphill cut up that facet. Ideally I would work on this side and plane off like that. The trouble is then we've got end grain coming up so if I plane off this way it may cause breakout along these edges. Now when faced with a challenge like this the first thing you should be doing is sharpening your plane. So for this I am going to go across the grain like this. So I'm going to be planing with the grain on these short components and then actually going off the end grain here but it's going to be at such a steep angle that it shouldn't cause any breakout hopefully. If I was going off like this then that's pretty certain I was going to experience some. We'll see though, you can never really predict these things and it's only regret afterwards that you experience. So I'm just flushing off some of the joinery of the dovetails and I promised you earlier in the series I'd show you how to fix minor gaps in dovetails. Now usually this only applies to gaps of this size, something less than 
well probably around half a millimeter i reckon and what it involves is planing the end grain in the direction of the gap thus causing minor breakout on the end grain to fill it let's see if we can do it now and just from doing that you can see that it has improved it somewhat there's still a little bit you could do there but it's definitely better and from there with a gap that small the only thing you've got to do is put a little bit of glue in there give it a sand and then the sawdust will create a paste that will fill it and that gap is so small that even if the paste doesn't perfectly match the tones of the wood it won't be noticeable so that's a really good way of fixing gaps that are uh, half a millimetre or so. Ones like this however are slightly larger than half a millimetre may need some extra attention. Now for this ideally it well it works best on oak because oak's got this lovely capability of mushrooming upon impacts and that kind of gives away how we're going to address this. It involves using a hammer and hitting the end grain to mushroom it out. Ideally what you'd have for this is a ball peen hammer because with that you've got a nice rounded surface that you can hit in that area and mushroom it really nicely. With a flat face hammer like this it's difficult to actually locate it in the area you need and because it's a spread out impact area you don't get as much uh, bang for your buck I suppose. The other thing that would be really useful at this point is if the end grain was still sitting proud of the dovetails because then I could really whack it, mushroom it out, plane it flat and then there wouldn't be any marks left over by the hammer. But because this is already flush with the tails, if I was to do any hammering on here then that's going to actually indent into the piece and after mushrooming it out I'm going to have to plane out all those dents. Now I'm going to attempt to fix it this way on here and hope that the dents left over aren't too prominent or difficult to remove. So I'm going to be using this little bit of metal to pinpoint the impact area and then tap on the top of that with the hammer and move it about, tilt it in different ways in order to hopefully spread out that end grain. You can also soften the end grain slightly with a little bit of methylated spirits or uh, denatured alcohol works quite well. Because it's so thin it soaks into the end grain really nice and deep and will help soften it. Also obviously it doesn't stain the wood afterwards because it just evaporates. Really soak it. So it's absolutely mullered as you can see but there is no gap on that tail anymore. And if we have a look that's only dipping by about just under a millimetre I think so that won't be hard to plain flush now. Now I'm actually going to do that on the rest of these gaps here because that you know that works absolutely brilliantly uh, but I'm just going to do it with water this time. I think that'll work just as well. Let's really try and squeegee it into that end grain if you can. Well, so that's looking really good already but we'll just put a tiny bit of glue along each of those edges where the gaps were. Well, basically just do it on all of them, why not? Squeegee that in. This will help solidify some of those fibres that uh, mushroomed out. Give it a sand. I'll do this properly later but just for now. And there you go so you can't see any gaps at the edge of those tails anymore it just needs a bit of a clean up on the surface you can see that the metal from the hammer reacting with some of the other like water and things i've put on it has reacted with the tannins in the oak and caused this dark staining that will all sand out though the main thing we're looking at is well the main thing we're not looking at i suppose is the gaps they are gone so like i said for that the best hammer for it is a ball peen hammer with that rounded end on it because it helps spread out the impact area whilst not leaving dents that are too prominent or too difficult to remove afterwards it's ideal for this and it does work on a variety of timbers but i find that oak works really well because it it just holds its structure well without cracking while being mushroomed over whereas other timbers especially other harder timbers are too brittle to do that and as soon as you start whacking them they end up splitting and it doesn't look too good the other thing that also makes it possible on oak is it naturally looks quite rustic and so if there is like tiny bits of fracturing and stuff like that on end grain parts then it just it blends in with that coarse grain again if you're looking at maple you're not going to get away with it. Any tiny blemish on that is going to be prominent and it's not going to look good. And so for gaps this size, uh, like where you can fit a ruler in them quite easily, these require some sort of special attention. Firstly, let's just get all that gunk out of there. 
that's just gonna make things more difficult. The best way to fill gaps like this is with solid wood itself, whether that's a little chunk or an off cut like this or a piece of veneer that matches the wood itself. What you don't want to be doing is filling this with dust and glue because by the time those mix together it doesn't usually match with the tones of the wood and you end up getting this, uh, it almost looks like a piece of MDF, well it basically is MDF, it's dust and glue filling up the gap and it doesn't look good so ideally try and fill it with a solid piece of wood. And if you want to make the repair look really good match it with the end grain. So I've got a piece of brown oak that I'm going to insert in here. If the gap was down the front then I would probably do it with a piece of red oak and have the end grain poking up this way. So what we're going to do is use a chisel to break off a little piece of brown oak from this chunk. And this might take a few attempts to get right. Okay, so look. No, could probably do a bit better than that. Right, so this bit's good. I've managed to break off a bit that is wedge shaped. That just happened through the natural splitting of the timber and is ideal. It's quite tight towards the bottom, but what we're gonna do is bed it in with a little bit of glue and then hit that down with a hammer. And as before, that hammer is gonna slightly mushroom this wedge and spread that gap even further and make sure there's no hairline gaps in it. It is a little bit tight at the moment, so we're just gonna get a bit of sandpaper and smooth out some of those edges first. So a bit of glue in there, really squeegee it in again. So there you go, there's the, uh, there's the repaired gap. Now if you were looking for it, you would see that little line down there. It's very hard to see, but it is visible. If you're looking for it, you would probably spot it, but to anyone else who looks at this box, there is not a chance they would spot that. Not a chance, especially as you'll see when we put a finish on it and the contrast is bumped up between the red oak and the brown oak, that little brown line there will be, uh, it, it won't be, it won't exist. And so that's three quick ways of filling any small gaps in any joinery. Just as a reminder, anything less than half a millimetre, usually dust and glue is all you need. Anything between 0.5 and 1 millimetre, you probably want to go to the hammering method to start spreading out some of that grain and then finish up with the glue and dust. And anything larger than one millimeter, you're probably gonna to wanna to resort to some solid blocks of wood. Wedge those in there, mushroom them out with the hammer, and then do the dust and glue technique on top of that, and you should be able to fill quite a lot of gaps. So it's like a, it, there's a three stages to it, and you can either start at the very end, or you can start right at the beginning if things are really bad. Also got a little bit down here where the Japanese sauce slipped when I was cutting out these facets. So we just do a little bit of glue in there and because it's a gap of about a millimetre we're going to go for the shim method. Just like that, the box is sorted. How cool does that look? It looks really good, doesn't it? Even the back, we've managed to sort out a lot of those dovetails. They're looking very nice and uh, yeah, 
pretty damn good. Now yesterday I went ahead and took the clamps off the top, got it all cleaned up, got the lipping flush with the rest of the veneer and tried to take off some of the veneer tape that was on here. It, I mean it wasn't veneer tape, it was some horrible disgusting gummy stuff that should not be stuck to veneer by any means but there we go. So I got most of that off, it still requires a bit of sanding but we can sort of see what the finished panel will look like. We've got some really nice figure either side as well. And as you may remember we made the lipping pretty oversized so there's quite a lot to come off here. It's not going to be anywhere near as thick as this once we're done. So that's going to be the first job, getting this to fit in the box and actually plane it to the correct size this time. Oh, f yeah. There you go. Thank you. Ice cream. We've got the lid fitted in the box and we're going to call it there for this episode. Now before you go, the way this is going to work is this video is obviously going to go out, you're watching it now. The next video, I've decided what I'm going to do is an overview of the entire garden workshop series because once this box is done, we're done here. I can finally move back to the workshop. So I'm going to do an overview of all three boxes mashed into one video. And then at the end of that video is where the results will be drawn for the three winners of each of these boxes. So you're not going to see this one finished until the end of that video, just so um, just so you got a little surprise at the end to look forward to. I think once this gets cleaned up and once we get finished on this walnut burr and add a nice little handle to the top, it's going to look spectacular. So as always, guys, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please do not forget to press the like button and subscribe if you haven't already and I'll see you in the next one.